Well, this morning we start a new series uh, titled Encounters with Jesus. That's where we'll be for the balance of the summer. Let me invite your attention to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. While you're turning there, uh, just a thought from last week as we talked uh, to fathers and challenged fathers. I realize there are some fathers who uh, have kids that are grown. Maybe they're not walking as closely with the Lord as you wish. Uh, maybe some of you feel like you can't influence your kids as much as you'd like for different reasons. Let me just remind you, as long as you have breath, as long as God gives you breath in your lungs, you can have significant influence on your kids through prayer. And it works. You should be talking to God about your kids regularly. And in, in praying, and by the way, if you don't know what to pray for your kids, you just shoot me an email, and I'll give you some good uh, scriptural prayers you can pray for your grown children. And as you're praying, you should also pray for the opportunity to speak into the life of your kids, even if you've not done that before. Uh, God can certainly arrange circumstances that make them open to your spiritual words of influence. So talk to God about your kids and look for the opportunity to talk to your kids about God. Well, the encounter this morning we're looking at here in Luke 12 deals with the materialism problem we have as humans. Now, lest you think um, that I went out and picked a text on money because we're receiving a special offering today, I want you to know that several weeks ago I planned the summer out and picked these encounters, and this just happened to be one of those that was in there. But it's certainly a good idea uh, from time to time to see what the Scripture says about what we do with the blessings that God has given us. So we're in Luke chapter 12. I'm going to jump in in verse 13 and read down to verse 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, to the crowd, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear, tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now let me back up a bit and, and make sure we all understand the setting. The setting is described back in chapter 12 and verse 1 where it says, thousands have gathered, many thousands. So this is a huge crowd that had gathered to hear Jesus. And as you know, not all of those who gathered are followers. In fact, there were some in the crowd who were actually against Jesus. Not just the religious leaders, but even some people in the crowd uh, who, who didn't like his teachings. They didn't like the fact that he claimed to be the Son of God. They didn't like the fact of, of his claims to lordship. Well, you know what? People today don't like that either. When you agree, and not that you have to agree, but when you agree with your life that Jesus is Lord, it requires significant change in your life. And so the people didn't necessarily, most of them didn't like his teaching. But also in the crowd, of course, were those who were curious and those who were genuine seekers. Verse 1 says, so many have gathered that they are trampling one another. Now, I love the way the uh, King James reads in verse 1. It says they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people insomuch that they trode on one another. Now, King James can be a bit archaic, sometimes even hard to read, but it certainly can provide or draw some pretty dramatic pictures. First of all, it says it was an innumerable multitude. There were too many to number or count. It wasn't just a few thousand. It was an innumerable multitude. And how about the word trode? They trode on each other. You know, I, I wish... It, First of all, I imagine if they were a polite crowd, you probably heard a lot of this as a crowd was gathering. Oh, pardon me, I didn't mean to trode on you. <laughs> you know, I got thinking, I wish I'd known the word trode when I was a student pastor. All right, all right, nobody run. The pizza's here. Let's be careful not to trode on one another getting to the pizza. Slow down, slow down, no troding. Okay, you guys that are offended because I'm picking on King James, you send your email to jmiller at gsfpc.org. <laughs> King James is good. 
Unlike me, Jesus had been teaching the crowd some pretty deep truths at this point. If you look at those first 12 verses of, uh, of chapter 12, he's telling them not to get caught up in, in hypocritical religion, not to say that, that he's Lord, you have a relationship with God if that's not true. Tells them if you're an imposter, you're going to be exposed, you need to fear God, not men. So he's teaching them all these vital truths, but this guy in verse 13 and 14, he isn't there to hear Jesus' teaching. He has come because he wants Jesus to do something for him. And sometimes that's still true of people today. They want Jesus to do, what can Jesus do for me? This man is probably the younger son of his family. His older brother must be there too because he says to Jesus, tell my brother as if he's there to divide the inheritance with me. Now, if you've studied the Old Testament uh, even just a bit, you know that the firstborn received a double portion of the inheritance when, when the father, the family patriarch, died. But he also had the responsibility of caring for his mother, uh, any unmarried sisters, he had that responsibility. So it wasn't like it was just money, money that he could burn. But the younger son, for whatever reason, felt like, hey, I should have been given more. I should have gotten more out of this deal. He was concerned about worldly material matters, not the spiritual matters that Jesus was teaching on. It'd be like if I was standing up here uh, preaching a, a gospel message telling people how to be saved, and Joe Statton said, excuse me, pastor, could you tell my wife to please stop spending so much money? I'm sure that doesn't happen at your house. No. But wouldn't that be odd? What a horrible and rude interruption, and yet this man, this young fellow, is standing before the one who, to whom the whole world is going to give account. The whole world is going to be judged spiritually, and he asked him to intercede in a very trivial, uh, worldly, civil matter. Well, if you look in verse 14, Jesus gets the man in the crowd refocused on more important matters. First in verse 14, he says, I haven't come to settle petty earthly disputes. And then in verse 15, he, he warns them, you need to be on your guard against every form. You need to be wary of covetousness. What is covetousness? Covetousness is the eager, excessive desire for wealth or possessions. And you can imagine that kind of desire, what kind of sin it could get people into. Now, I know I've mentioned this before, but Jesus spoke more about money and materialism than he did about heaven and hell combined. Jesus spoke more about money and materialism than he did about faith and prayer combined. Why? Because money... And, and material wealth and materialism is often a stumbling block to a right relationship with God. Think of Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Matthew 19, he said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Of the 39 parables you'll find recorded in the Gospels, the 39 parables that Jesus taught, 11 of the 39 were about money. And here in Luke 12 is one of those parables. He, he's teaching in response to this young man's request, and he introduces a parable by saying, one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. What does he mean one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions? Well, what, what is life? It's about much more than the physical. This man was simply focused on the physical, on the worldly, on the material. That's not what life is about. Life is about more than material things. The important thing about life is spiritual life. The important thing about life is to be right spiritually with God. You're not going to buy your way into heaven. Rich or poor, the only way you get into heaven is if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So here's the story. Here's the parable that Jesus tells. Look in verses 16 and 17. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. So here's a man who is, who's very prosperous. He had all he needed and then some. Evidently, he was a good farmer. His crops were so plentiful that he no longer had room in his barns. He had more than his barns could even hold. And I think when I read the story, I think this man probably had a pride issue as well. Who caused him to have bountiful crops? Let me assure you, no matter how much he studied farming, no matter what state-of-the-art techniques he used, he had plentiful crops because God provided abundant crops. 
And I can't tell you how often I have to stop and think, wait a minute, it's not what I can produce. It's not my ability to create prosperity. It's not about what man can do. It's the blessing of God. I thought this week about God's warning to Israel before they moved in to occupy the promised land. In Deuteronomy 8, he gave them these words, take care lest you forget the Lord your God. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, you have a sense of pride, and you forget the Lord your God. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. That was this man's attitude. This man had more than he needed, yet he wanted more, and he wanted to just sock it all away. And I would say to you, obviously, he's not a godly man, but I would say to you, he's not even a good man. A good man would have at least looked to those less fortunate and shared his abundance with them. But this man is self-absorbed, he's self-indulgent, he's only interested in his own welfare. Verse 18 and 19, so he says, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. They didn't have many storage units at that time, evidently. Just a thought. And I will store all of my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. So his plan is to store up more. He's only thinking of the here and now. He's not thinking about eternity. He's thinking about what he can enjoy in this life. He's not thinking at all about the life to come. Evidently, he hadn't heard or didn't care about Jesus' teaching regarding future wealth. In Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This man is not thinking about anything but his own welfare. He's not thinking of God. He's not thinking of others. Nothing inherently wrong with money. But it's certainly true that those who are prosperous have a difficult time keeping a proper perspective on wealth. Paul spoke to this in 1 Timothy 6. You know, in 1 and 2 Timothy, he wrote these letters to his young apprentice, his pastor Timothy, to help him know how to deal with different issues in the church. And in 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 17, he addresses those who are part of the kingdom of God who are well off. Here's what he says. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides all things to enjoy. Now listen to this specific instruction. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves treasures as a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of what is truly life. That's the instruction he gives to those who have more than they need. Build your treasures there, not here. Send it ahead. Build a foundation for yourself. You know, I try to repeat this phrase to you often because we are a congregation that is blessed materially and spiritually, and that is the fact that we are blessed to be a what? Oh, y'all haven't heard me? I don't know how many times I've said that. I could go back and check. We're blessed to be a what? A blessing. We're blessed to be a blessing. That's what Paul's saying here in 1 Timothy 6. Listen, God provides. You need to do good. You need to be rich in good works. You need to be generous and ready to share. This man didn't understand that. He didn't get that or he didn't care. And so as the parable comes to a close here in verse 20 and 21, we see that God is calling the loan. God's calling the loan. What, what am I saying? Well, God has given every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, God's given all of us the stewardship of life, our life and everything that he blesses us with, and this man's time is up. God's calling the loan. Look at verse 20 and 21. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Just like this man, we've arrived with nothing and we will leave the same way. 
The only way to have treasure in eternity is to send it on ahead. Now, it's a very, very simple story, but let me give you from this story, and I'll give you some extra text to with it. Let me give you seven principles that we need to understand, especially about our material blessings, our worldly wealth. Principle number one, God owns everything. We're just his managers. We're just stewards. It doesn't belong to us. Later on in Luke 12, you see the parable of the faithful servant. In Luke 19, the parable of the talents. And many of the parables that Jesus told were about stewardship. We're not owners. We don't have right to it. We're simply stewards who one day are going to be held into account. It sure helps when you recognize it doesn't belong to you and God has every right to it whenever he calls for it. Second principle, your heart follows the money. We looked at Matthew 6, 21, where Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is. Your heart follows the money. Where you're putting the money will be indicative of what's important, what's in your heart, what you live for. Number three, heaven, not earth, is your home. If you're a child of God, this is not your home. You're alien here. You're a, you're a stranger here. Your home is in heaven. And Paul's instruction, Colossians 3, 2, is something that ought to rattle through your brain every day. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. Why? Because that's your home. That's what you need to be focused on. Not here, not what's happening here, not what you can collect here. Number four, the only way to preserve wealth is to send it ahead. Or send it home. We saw in Matthew 6, 20 and 21 that if we lay up treasures on earth, moth and rust destroy, thieves break in and steal. But if we send it ahead, if we lay up treasure in heaven, moth and rust can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. Number five, giving is the only antidote to materialism. If you're materialistic and you need to break that curse in your life, give. Giving is the antidote to materialism. Jesus in Matthew 6, you can't serve two masters. You love the one, hate the other, be devoted to one, despise the other. Listen, if you're a giver, if you understand that God owns everything and you give where he tells you to give, you're not going to be a materialistic person. You can't be both. Number six, God prospers you not to raise your standard of living. God prospers you to raise your standard of giving. You say that one again. God prospers you not to raise your standard of living, but to raise your standard of giving. That's why Paul gave those instructions for Timothy to give the church in 1 Timothy 6, to do good, be rich in good works, generous and ready to share. You know, I realized several years ago, and and we're not wealthy, but compared to the rest of the world, we're pretty doggone rich in our house. And um, I realized a few years ago, growing up in a single-parent home with a single-mom school teacher um, at a private school, which is significantly less income, um, doing without some things, wondering what was going to happen next week, next month. Because I grew up in that kind of environment, I I have to be careful um, not to hoard, not to hang on to stuff for the future. And a few years ago, I realized, it's almost like God said to me, you're like the man trying to build bigger barns. I realized um, that all the money I was putting away for retirement, all that I was setting back to make sure we'd be okay one day, was to some degree a lack of faith. I'm not saying you shouldn't prepare for retirement, you shouldn't think about the future, but, but I realized God was calling me to take a step of faith, and there was a, a percentage, a portion of that, that I felt like God was telling me to stop putting away for me, but to put it away for others. And so every year, there's a portion of what I would normally give to my retirement fund that I set aside for people who have need. Here's the interesting thing, and I'm not saying this would happen every time. Our blessings sometimes are spiritual. They're not material in nature, but within um, two or three months of making that decision and and following through. I had a conversation with Joe. Hey, God's told me I need to do this. This money needs to go toward people in need. Within about two or three months after that, a church member came to me and said, hey, um, I've got some ideas on some ways that you can um, make sure your retirement's solid. And I have not in, I don't know how many years it's been now, Joe. I don't know if you'll know. It's been six, seven, eight years now I started doing that. I have yet to have a single year that all of that money that I was giving away has not been 
replaced. And I don't need it, and I'm not going to hoard it. Number seven, last, giving is an opportunity to experience God's faithfulness and to increase your faith. You remember Malachi 3.10 when the Lord was giving the instruction to bring the tithe into the storehouse. He said, test me. Check it out. You bring it and see if I won't pour out so much blessing on you that you don't have room enough. You know what God's saying? You give faithfully to me with the right heart and the right motivation. You give faithfully to me and spiritually you're going to have to tear down your barns and big, bigger barns because I'm going to bless you beyond anything that you can imagine. Now, this morning, for the last several weeks, culminating in this morning, we've been asking you to give um, to a ministry project that will enable us to get outside our walls, to get places where there are people who don't know Christ, and to be more faithful in our mission. I'll never forget the first capital campaign I was a part of, and I didn't intend to be a part of it. I was in seminary. Um, My little church growing up at home in Florida, we had never had a capital campaign. I was in seminary, and the church that my, I was in Fort Worth, the church that my sister went to down in Austin that she'd been in for many, many years was in a capital campaign. And I would visit there pretty regularly when I would would drive down to Austin, but I wasn't even a member of the church. And so one weekend I go down, and I find out that night they're having their big a service where everybody brings their offerings to kick off their capital campaign. And I don't know why I even went to the service, because again, it wasn't my church. But when I went in to the service that night, <clears throat> I left my checkbook out in the car. And I'll give you time in just a minute to go get your checkbook if you need to. <laughs> but really, the reason I left my checkbook in the car, I was in seminary. Um, I was there on scholarship. I would work a little bit for odds and ends, but I basically was living off scholarship. I had enough money in my checking account. This was in January, and classes started in about two weeks. I had enough money in my checking account to pay my tuition, and there was a little less than $100 left after that. So there's no point in me taking my checkbook into that service. It wasn't my church. I'm sitting there, and uh, I begin to get convicted that God is calling me to give to this church's building campaign because I believed in what what they were trying to do. I got up, went out, got my checkbook, came back in, sat on it for a while. Same figure kept coming back, and I'm thinking, I, I can't do that. That's what I need to pay my tuition. It was the same amount of the tuition. Well, finally, I, I, I don't know if I've ever sensed anything as clearly from the Lord as I did at that time, but finally I knew that that was the amount, and I wrote the check and gave the check. And so here I am with a less than $100 in my checking account, and tuition's due the following week. Went back to Fort Worth that night, got up Monday morning. Back then, you didn't have seminary classes on Monday because uh, most, a lot of the professors were at extensions and places on campus. There were no classes. So I got up and did a few things, and I went over to the post office on campus to check my mail. I'd just written the check about 12 hours before. In my mailbox was a check from someone back in Florida. You, you want to guess how much the check was for? the same amount I'd written that I needed for tuition that next week. I began to realize that God, when he calls us to give sacrificially, it's an opportunity to experience his faithfulness and to increase our faith. I've never really since that time worried about giving God too much and and not having enough. But here's the bottom line this morning. It's, It's not just about money. It's about life. It's a lordship issue. All that we are and all that we have is a blessing from God. Our person and our possessions belong to him. And as our creator and as Lord, he has has the right to call us to surrender ourselves and our stuff because it all belongs to him. We will never, ever outgive God. But when we give, the blessing we get from that. You know, for me, I'm, I'm excited about giving to the project we're about to undertake because it's a God thing. 
And I don't, I don't want, I'm, I'm not going to compel you to give this morning and guilt you to give this morning. I just don't want folks to miss an opportunity. We're going to invest in something today that has eternal benefit. We probably won't see it until we get to heaven. But the investment we're making today as we handle and stewardship this investment properly is going to reap eternal reward and eternal fruit. That's something I want to be a part of. That's something God has called us to do as his people to advance the kingdom and get the gospel outside these walls. Would you bow with me this morning?